Oh my goodness, I think the technical difficulties are finally done. Yes? Yes, we are live. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and Moogles of all ages to the Moogle Cup kickoff race. I am Schwanz 27 Thank you so much, Drinks Glue, for uh, picking up the slack. For some reason, somebody uh, was working in my backyard, I guess, and snipped my uh, my internet wires or something like that, because uh, when I tried to push the beepity bops to go live and make the buttons go blinky blinky nothing happened speaking of nothing happened i'm here with double down double down how are we doing tonight really good um you know having a good night i just was outside uh snipping internet wires in a neighbor's <laughs> backyard and uh i i don't know why it's just a habit i've been picking up lately and uh i find it satisfying strangely but uh you know I, coming off of that kind of high i'm excited i'm really excited to see some some moogle cup action here yeah, so for those of you that didn't fall asleep between the kickoff and now, uh, again, apologies for the uh, technical difficulties. The Moogle Cup is a new tournament that we are announcing for our newer players that we've matched up with mentors. And we are doing a dry run, I guess. It's not really a dry run because we've already figured out what the flags are. But we're doing a run of uh, the flag set that we went over earlier. Um we are tipping it in the favor of the runner slightly from our uh, standard Ultras League, where we do still have to unlock uh, Kafka with six characters and nine espers. Same Kafka Tower skip. However, we have uh, much stronger stats for our characters. We have lower MP costs, more generous chests and shops at lower prices, better dead check rewards, and undead bosses are restored with this flag set. Uh, and let's get a chat, I guess, from our runners to discuss what they think will happen with this particular set of flags. So first, one free fits. Your name's on the left-hand side. So thoughts about uh, the flag set and sort of how are you going to approach it from a mentor standpoint? Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of generous things going on. And so... When I look at something like this, I view it as a good opportunity to practice being really aggressive, um, trying to go really fast. I mean, we're always trying to go fast, but it's kind of like, I feel confident that we'll have the tools pretty early on to kind of know what we're doing in terms of like offense and end game strategy fairly quickly. And it's always fun to just see kind of how early I can push the gas pedal and, and just go. And so hopefully that's what I'm going to try to showcase in terms of approaching a, uh, a generous seed with like all of the goodies, you know, available through multiple ways. All right. And our other runner in the black with the pink trim, that's Gar. So Gar, <laughs> What are your thoughts and approaches here from a uh, from a runner standpoint for this flag set here? Well, I think that Fitz kind of nailed it on the head. A couple of the flags that I saw right away were that Super Balls are available for purchase, and we normally get the expensive rods flag turned on, but here we have cheap rods. So that combination of being able to buy Super Balls and the cheap rods really does mean that our early game should be pretty, pretty quick. We should be able to get off the ground and just start going very, very quickly. So I'm with Fitz on that one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hunt for some very, very early offense, and then I'm just gonna start doing checks, and uh, think, that'll be how I get through the scene. I think it's gonna be interesting, especially because now the shops. And chess, very attractive. It's shops, especially because of those rods and balls. But, uh, you know, the, the high tier item is also very powerful, almost making it where you maybe don't need the shops as much as the as much as the dead checks because the dead checks can carry you through. Now, I have one other question to ask, Gar, and, and that's based on your experience. Now, you were in the Moogle's first tournament, which I believe was year before last, uh, 2022, sounds right. Yeah, um, it's, it's been a bit. Yeah, you were a participant in that. Now you're a mentor in this. Do you want to talk about your perspective and, and what the experience was like in MFT? Sure. So when I signed up for MFT, I had been playing the randomizer for something like two weeks at the time. And over the course of MFT, that's Moogle's first tournament, I, I really did just 
I, I got a lot of skills. I learned a lot about both the vanilla game and how uh, how to do the randomizer effectively, just in general. This is basically the first randomizer, the first game ever, really, that I've tried to play at a competitive level. And the Boogles First Tournament really helped me get into that mindset. So I'm really, really, really hoping that the Moogle Cup here is going to do sort of the same thing, where we get people who are very, very interested in learning how to play this game competitively and just need a little bit of a nudge to kind of to, to kind of get there. So uh, thanks both to Double Down and to Drink School for putting this event together. I think this is going to be a fantastic way to get new players up and running. And, and one free fits. I know you've had some experience on the mentor side as well. You've had some some mentoring interactions with some of our players. Do you want to talk about what that's been like for you? Yeah, it's just a, a really fun time. Uh, I've had always had a good time doing it. It kind of makes me think about how I play because in order to mentor, I kind of have to generally be able to explain the whys and hows of kind of what I do in a race and that makes me better and has helped me like develop this inner mentor voice you know when i'm just racing solo but also early on when i started playing there were definitely a couple people in the community that helped me out by like reviewing a vod or just like hanging out in chat and giving tips when i was streaming a practice and so i've always wanted to just provide that for other players and i'm, I'm looking forward to to doing that a lot more all right, well, we will send you off to your respective corners as the good referees that we are. So, Fitz, get into your voice chat one. Gar, get into your voice chat two. And we'll get this race cracking and started. So, just to echo, you know, sort of what Fitz was saying there a little bit. Um, when you are a mentor and when you have to explain things to people that are, are newer, you better know what the heck you're talking about. It's almost like studying for a test. I used to have this friend in college and I have the friend loosely and he never went to class and he never studied but the night before the final exam he'd always you know have me over and say all right so let's go over what's going to be on the test and by me teaching it to them i sort of had to know all of the stuff on the test myself so it's a great way for both mentors and mentees to gain more knowledge about the game that they're doing here as well yeah that's that's how schwantz got me through college now you all have heard the story from, <laughs> from both ends you're welcome, Double Down. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the the other thing is when you are a mentor, trying to field the questions may also make you think differently about seeds. As we see, health from realm morph from Edgar, and I didn't quite see what Tara had on her. So those are our three characters to start us off here. And normally with a Terra start, you usually do what Gar does: go right to the sealed gate, came for all that juicy loot. Meanwhile, One Free Fits is going to go the more conventional Narsh route here. I don't think there's wrong with either one of these approaches. I personally like to get some more treasure before I go to the Sealed Gate, and that's because I pull on the little lever for the Sealed Gate Cave Ninja for my grinding, as there's an ice shield there. Very nice to have. Uh, Double Down, are you a Terra always go to Sealed Gate start, or uh, or I you? am. Depend. I'm I'm a hundred percent. You know, I see Terra, and as long as I'm not blanking out on my mind, I'm heading right for the sealed gate. And this, especially, I think I'm bound to do that because the chests are a little bit more juiced, a little bit more, uh, you know, picante. So uh, caliente, I guess we could even say the, the chests have some good stuff going for them. So any opportunity to open a whole bunch of chests and the sealed gate really gives you an opportunity to just crack a bunch of boxes and hope to find the goods. Uh, yeah, so apparently Terra also has Shock as one of her abilities, so that's one that we normally don't see in Ultra Stick. So already drinks glue, we are seeing the difference here between the uh, Moogle First Tournament flag set and what we're used to with Ultra Sleek. I think we were seeing that 35% <clears throat> random chest there as well, because that was a pretty loaded treasure room. Ice Shield, Minerva, plus the other goodies. Yeah, so are you also a head straight to the sealed gate with Terra type of person, or do you like to hang back and collect a little bit? It, it, it depends if I have a great starting ability or not, because as you mentioned, I, I'm really fond of that switch with the changes. 
uh, to Worlds Collide in general uh, right before Ultra Sleep Season 5 and that that switch will always be the same fight. And it's so game-breaking if that switch is a lucrative fight and that if you put yourself in a position to milk it, as you say. Um, if you have a great ability like Shock, then it's even easier to milk. But um, in an Ultra Sleep flag set, you won't have Shock. So that's not an option. So if you don't have a throw or something else to easily take advantage of it, you have to find it some other way somehow. So that's why... To answer your question in whole depends, but in short, I am looking to take care of that, take advantage of that switch as well. All right, we do have a go go at the end of the sealed gate cave, and we have an Illumina from uh, the heir to the Figaro throne there. So in uh, the Figaro castle and in World Brewing South Figaro, we get that Edgar discount. Everything is half off in the shops, and the shops are already cheap as it is. So I can understand here, Double Down, why Fitz decided to go this particular. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it opens up a lot of options. Even if the check reward is not that great, it opens up a lot of options. Now, one thing I'm interested to hear your perspectives on from both of you, um, you know, given the scaling is a little less and given the power level of the seed is expected to be more, one thing I think we see a lot of newer runners um, really taking a while to kind of get the hang of is how many checks to take before you start doing those other boss fights. You know, how much do you want to increase or in, in, increase? Yeah, that's the word. I had it right the first time. Increase that scaling before you start fighting encounters. Where do you two think we're going to sit on this one? Are we going to be taking a whole bunch of checks and putting progression up to like six or seven? Or uh, do we think people are just going to get right in and start swinging those Illuminas on some weak targets? I, I, I'm going to give you a little bit of deep insight here, okay? Part of that, my answer is going to be know your opponent. And one refits is the biggest Leet River advocate in the world, <laughs> in the community, probably in the entire galaxy, maybe this universe and all the other <laughs> universes combined. So... For his answer, um, ooh, I want to point out there, we are seeing Super Bowls for sale in the shop Gar is currently at. For Moogle Cup, Super Bowls are allowed, and that is because we want to showcase all the various parts of Final Fantasy XVI Worlds Collide. Um, in many event, or many event flag sets, you won't see Super Bowls, but we do want to teach our new runners everything that they can possibly use, possibly one day. And there are scenarios where, or flag sets where Super Bowls may be activated. So we'd like that to come up every once in a while. But to answer your question, um, I, I think for sure on Fitz's screen, because I, we're definitely going to Elite River first. Um, it's just a matter of how much looting we do first. And that's a skill in itself, is knowing what your opponent's going to do based on their tendencies, based on what they like to do. Or in my case, uh, do they like to go for the Mimi plays? Um, but Gar is a little more up in the air. I'm not sure where Gar will go. Yeah, well, the answer with anything Worlds Collide is it depends, right? Um, sort of as you mentioned, Double Down, it depends on what the abilities that your characters have at the start and uh, what you find sort of in treasure chests. So if I have stronger abilities or I find some big beefy weapons in chests, let's just say, I'm more comfortable with taking a bit more risk and bumping the scaling up more. And one other interesting thing is the higher the enemy scaling goes, you actually get more uh, XP, right? So it's kind of counterintuitive in, a, in that sort of way to say, well, you know, if you bump up the scaling, the enemies are going to be harder. That might be true, but they're also going to give you more XP too, right? So mm -hmm. suddenly that Leaf or Dark Winds fight, no, never mind, it's still going to be bad XP, but you sort of get my point, right? Is that sometimes you have to, you, you get out what you put in a little bit and we've got access to three free checks, including that really cheap Zen Thief that Gar had. So, uh, and then we haven't seen Gogo's cave, uh, but we do have some warp stones, I think both of our runners found. So we'll see if either one of them go for yet another free check here. Yeah, we're seeing a really conventional start here. Um, you know, just the two Figaro's and Sealed Gate. And again, I think that's something that a lot of mentors are probably going to take some time to talk to their mentees about, of getting into that sort of routine and having the sort of shorthand, because I think what a lot of our, our mentors are probably leveraging here is that you don't have to think too much about this stage of the game. You're kind of on autopilot. You know you've got Terra, so you're going to cruise through Sealed Gate. You'll pay a little bit of attention to the boxes you're opening. Um, but really, you can spend this time, it's five to ten minutes of looting and shopping, spend that time formulating a plan for the rest of the seed. Now, I think, do you, do you take that approach as well, Drinks Glue? Do you sort of use this opportunity to sort of plan for the, the rest? Uh, I, I will say that I have one of my previous protégés in the chat, Sawyer, and Sawyer may echo this sentiment as I've ingrained it into his head. You know, I, I send him the same text message every morning at 7 a.m. in that not all two chests are created equally. 
So what do I mean by that? I, I mean that 30 chests for you are in one seat can be entirely different than what you get from 30 chests in the other. So your game plan should always be when can I when can I start comfortably taking fights? Uh, whether those fights are monster or excuse me bosses or just regular formations that you may come across. Um, the moment you are ready, it's about the time you want to cut off that looting face. And from seed to seed, it's going to depend. Uh, sometimes you can walk into the treasure room and get enough to get you going right there. Sometimes you have to spend 10 to 12 minutes to find the prerequisite pieces of equipment to get going. So, as Swans echoes, and we'll probably say this a lot, it, it depends. But the thing I want, I would ingrain in my mentee, or my Moogle to take away from this, is that not all chests are created equal. Yeah, so I, I like to sort of talk through exactly what I'm going to do as it's happening. Sometimes you'll see me on stream do it as, here's the checks I'm going to go to. If I don't get a character at here, then I go there. But if I do, then I go some other place. And for me, I like to get to either my six characters or my nine espers first. And then that essentially cuts off a giant part of the game to me because then I'm only looking for one or the other types of progression, mm -hmm. right? So talking through, oh, uh, you know, Guard is thinking, I'm going to go to Azur's Mansion first. Why? There are fixed encounters in here to get me some levels and then a boss to potentially get me through. What happens if I find a character here? Do I take my party down to one and go to Gogo's free check because it's just across the pond on the other side? If it's not a character, if it's an Esper, if it's got something on it, do I go do Edgar's checks because he's got a dragon at the bottom of it and I can burn all sorts of spells if it's an Esper with really good spells on it. So these are sort of the things I'm thinking as I'm doing the, you know, mechanical monotony of walking through different areas of the game. Very well said. Um, I will say, just for this exact flag set, um, if you were for... Or, uh, it's kind of hard to pass on... Uh, Going to seal gate, especially with the tear start, it's it's almost ill advised. Well, it, well, it is ill advised, excuse me. But Bits, for example, when he went to South Figaro or uh, Figaro Castle to get his che Edgar check, his free check on the throne, that was an Illumina. And in the item shop, one of the item shops, there was a gauntlet in one of the treasure chests. That that's enough right there for one character. Plus, then you have your shock start. Um, that that almost encapsulates in a whole what I mean by not all chests are created equal. That Illumina Gauntlet build for his Terra, plus, or for his Edgar, than his uh, Shock Start. That is two S tier characters right there, and it took all of a minute to come across that. All we had to do was talk to one guy, open one chest, and then see what our abilities had, and that's fantastic. Um, if we had some less fortunate abilities, less fortunate chests there, again, we could have been on that 10 to 12 minute range, but again, not all chests are created equal. Yeah, that's, that's really reading the seed right there and seeing that I've got, I've got a Gauntlet Illumina, which means I can beat most single target bosses I'm going to encounter, I, you know, I might have to reset out of one or two. And I've got shock, which means I can clear fixed encounters quickly. So you're exactly right. That's all the pieces you need to start getting into something like, um, you know, dare I say it, starting it into like the Elite River or something like that, where you've got all the pieces to kind of cruise through the river. Mm -hmm. What's even better is with uh, Realm's health ability, you don't have to buy tonics or potions or anything like that, and you're less worried about wiping to those forced encounters because you could literally just heal your party at the start of every single fight, right? So that is certainly... It becomes a more uh, uh, thoughtful play there as Gar gets an Esper from Alzers, Fitz picked up the Tizen Thief here, and we'll see where else we decide to go. Now, if I find Super Balls in a shop, um, my instinct is to just rush either a boss or a dragon straight away. What about you know? What about you guys? If you if you're our runners, you see Super Balls in the shop. Is that sort of what you're thinking as well? That really was the meta, especially a couple of years or a couple of seasons ago in some of our leagues. Um, <clears throat> that was really the approach, right? Of get those Super Balls, start getting some. Uh, some scaling up so that you're going to get maximum value as you super ball something to get those higher levels, like the higher XP from a higher leveled boss. And then, yeah, abuse the super ball, kill a dragon or kill an early boss and uh, just jump ahead of scaling. Um, mm -hmm. Drinks Clue, I'm, I'm assuming you're on the same page as well. Yeah, the nice thing about super balls, as long as it's a one on one fight or there's only one enemy on the other side of the screen, you're not fighting hiding, you're not fighting tentacles. Or you're not fighting the stooches there's no wrong answer with the super ball um it's just a matter of how does rng bless you or unbless you 
Um, and and just to touch on the Super Bowl thing a little bit more, uh, in Manoa Final Fantasy VI, Super Bowls are in one location, and that is the World of Ruins Zen item shop. Um, so they have a chance in Ultras League and in the Moogle Cup flag sets to be in one shop as well. Plus or minus 20% of the randomized shuffling of the items but there's there's a good chance that there's super balls in one item shop out there somewhere on average and if you can come across those it just opens up the early game so much for you so easily because you know we have that aluminum gauntlet that aluminum gauntlet is not going to do the damage that a super ball will do on average um i don't know the numbers off the top of my head but i would dare say a super ball is going to do three to four times more damage at level three than just about anything you can do say for cracking a flame shield on an enemy weak to flame yeah, I, I think it's one of many ways to get ahead. And I think we're seeing a lot of them in this seed exactly. So, I mean, this is really a good example of what you can expect from this flag set. If you're an experienced player, you're looking at this and you're seeing this is like a jet flag set, right? We've got Ultimate Time 16, we've got Shock, we've got Illumina Gauntlet, we've got an experience that can return us hideout. There's so much power available to these runners in 13 minutes. Mm -hmm. The idea is not, of course, to make these jet seeds. What we're really looking to do here with the Moogle Cup is that this flag set is to make sure that our newer players don't get into situations where they're just heading, hitting the head against our wall. We've all had that in Ultra Sleep, right? Where you start with uh, Runic Health and GP Rain, or Runic uh, Health and- I don't know, and... maybe Gogo, Umaro, and Morph Mog. Just yeah, throw that, that out that... there. <laughs> <laughs> good, good example. I've never played a seed like that last week. Um, but you know, for a newer player, that's one where you're scratching your head. It's like, I don't like any of these checks. I don't like any of these abilities. I don't like this game. I'm going to go play Jets of Time. We don't want that. So <laughs> what we're looking for here is not to, I mean, we've, of course, if you want to come and like play these as like an experienced player and get Jet Seeds, you can, you'll get great times on these seeds. But really what we're just trying to do is make sure that players have a lot of different options. They're going to get a taste of a lot of different offenses and they're not going to have those, ex those frustrating experiences where like, I've got no way to progress. I'm stuck. This game sucks, and I should have stuck with Free Enterprise. It's important to memorize or know too that it's really easy as a seasoned player to forget that. Oh yeah, a Valiant Knife doesn't work with Stray Cat, but a fixed dice with Stray Cat is almost a dream for some players. Uh, one guy, with notwithstanding, uh, some people know who I'm <laughs> talking about. Nevertheless, some things just pair with more things better than others, and. Really, the Moogle Cup, the flag set is kind of designed around throwing more of those things at you, not so you can produce great times and pat yourself on the back. Feel free to do that, by the way. I'm a big believer in do whatever you want, have fun, live your life how you want. But for the intent of this flag set, it's to put more of those great things on the tables for newer players so they can learn how to utilize them when they come across them in their War and Triad flag sets, or their Ultra League runs, or their pickup races, or their whatever the various weekly egg stakes we have that they're more better equipped in the future to utilize the great pieces of offense in this game. Yeah, this seed almost feels like drinking from a fire hose though with the amount of options that are available here, yeah. right? So it, it also might be overwhelming in some aspects and that sometimes is a good teaching point. You mm -hmm. just need to win and beat the game. You don't need to win more. You don't have to have the super uber ultimate build on every single one of your characters and mm -hmm. you could spend all that time micro optimizing all of the gear to make everything super super perfect if you're just good enough to beat the next boss in front of you that's what you need and you just need to do it faster it's faster to swing a bunch of swords at something than it is to say you know just spam the ultimate big blue button every single time and runners will have to learn that over time as well and i think, I think we'll my Oh, go ahead, Oh, of course. Um, I, I think we'll see that as well in some one of our sync races between our Moogles in that one one Moogle maybe comes across Ultima, and he proceeds to spam Ultima for the next hour and completes his seed, and then he may be shocked to see that his opponent finished 20 minutes faster than him. Ultima is great. It's the strongest spell in the game, but it does have a very long animation time, and if we're putting more of those amazing items in front of you, it's not just to give you the easiest one so you can just, you know, mimic the vanilla game it's more to teach you that hey if you have ultima there are some new cases where you want to use that instead of the illumina but more often than not that illumina is going to get you through stuff faster just by the reduced animation time yeah i, I think my moogles probably got sick of me saying this in moogles first tournament uh but i always told my moogles that my, my sort of mantra not the not the blitz but my saying was Good enough is good enough. You know, you don't need to have four killer characters who are all doing quad nines with every single action. You just need to have enough damage to kill the bosses in front of you and to beat Kefka at the end. So there does become that that sort of moment of like, are you gilding the lily? Are you kind of trying to make perfect where like good enough is going to get you there? So yeah, 
good enough is good enough. If you've got stuff that's going to kill all the things in front of you and you're going to finish the seed, you don't have to keep hunting chests. You don't have to keep finding power. You don't need four characters who are all amazing. You really just need one, two, or maybe three. Or oh. I guess it's one free fist sees. Maybe you just need a Yeti. Yeah. One of, speaking of amazing characters, that's a Yamaro from the let River from uh, for one free fits. And Zetsu, oh my goodness. Just to interject here for a quick second, One Free Fitz did the Returner's Hideout and mm -hmm. found himself an experienced egg in Returner's Hideout. He sure did. Yeah, he Gar egg. has not gone there yet. Rookie and mistake. The experienced egg is nice <laughs> at any point in the game, unless you find it in the validation chest in Kefka's Tower. Um, but with One Free Fitz finding it early, he will get much more value out of that. Yeah, and that yeah, is com completely agree. Uh, uh, my, my saying was, "Perfect is the enemy of the possible." Write that down. Put that on a T-shirt. Um, but it sort of echoes the same sentiment you guys have been saying here, right? So um, interesting that we now have potentially multiple paths through the seed with uh, with Yeti versus Setzer. So the question, I guess, for you guys could be. Um, when would you do some of these more off the wall plays like the Leap River or, you know, what is sort of the check hierarchy kind of look for you when you're teaching to newcomers what to do when? Ooh, uh, I like that question a lot. So, and, and it's, I mean, you know, this harkens back to what we said probably about 13, 14 minutes ago. It depends, but I mean, it's so situational. And I think that's really the benefit of the mentoring approach where, I mean, you could write, for instance, let's just say a 64 page guide on Worlds Collide. And uh, <laughs> who would you know, do such a thing? Uh, who, what kind of nerd would do that? I know, but, and, and I mean, you can try to cover it all there, but you can't, so much of it is so situational, right? So like for me at the beginning of a seed, I really like checks where they have fixed encounters and no boss at the end. I love Imperial Camp and I love the other one that's like that. Serpent Trench, that's it. I was just going to run out of steam there. But, you know, I like those early. Maybe in the mid and late game, I don't love those as much. Serpent Trench, kind of long at the end of the game. Um, you know, at the beginning, I don't really love uh, a straight-up boss fight, especially if I have to run for a while to get there. Whereas late game, if I'm annihilating everything, give me that boss fight all day, every day. So it's stuff like that that I think is situational. I sort of, I have a feel, it's hard to sometimes articulate why I want to do certain checks where. Sometimes it's like, I want this check because my airship is like three feet away from it. Sometimes it's like, I want this check because I just got a character and it's one of that character's checks. And I think that's going to get me my next character because that's how the seed rolls. So it really is very situational. And again, it's just, it's hard to come up with those rules of thumb, but it's a lot easier to impart that on a live fire exercise. If I'm sitting shotgun, if I'm watching behind Gar right now and saying, oh, you just got Setzer. You know what? Setzer's tomb, Daryl's tomb, I guess. It's not his tomb. Daryl's tomb might be a good spot to go if you're looking for that sixth character. Lou, are you about the same? I'm a big proponent of doing the multiple checks first. Uh, for example, you know, if you have Lock and Yamaro, then Water Ruin Narsh becomes a great play. If you can work it so that you can do both at the same visit, that, that's even better. If not, the other ones such as uh, Mount Zozo, which is one of science checks, or another one of science checks, is check, checks are really science saving grace in that Dome of Dream and that you're gonna have boom, boom, boom checks right after each other. And that allows you to just combo things together. Um, plus it increases your checks count. Um, so that way, you know, not so much in the Moogle Cup, but in other flag sets that utilize the check skip, you're building that check number up. So that way you are able to capitalize on the check skip um, even more so. So, but the kind of counterintuitive to that, I, I'm, a, I also, I'm also okay with taking a chance or two. What do I mean by a chance or two? Going to an unorthodox spot is is a great play every once in a while or once or twice. But if that's all you do, as Falconhead just says in this says in the chat, if you only do select slow checks, you only have a slow time. So if you take one orthodox play or two, you take a stab at it and it works out great. If not, you know, just move on, get back on the no, more known path. But if if that's all you do, um, it's not going to work out for you because there's nothing that's saying there is more likely to be a good character at Burning House than there is at Dumbass Siege. And obviously, Dome of Siege is a much faster check than Burning House. Yeah, so as Falcon it also points out, our princess is in another castle, not in Umaro's checks and not in Cesar's checks. So even though our 
our runners have diverged a little bit here. They'll they'll come back together in Kumbaya at some point, and I suspect that the point will be either we go down to one of Edgar's things or we continue on the Terra, you know, sort of bus. Because uh, oh, and we haven't done Gogo -Go yet either. So those are sort of the three spots here. Uh, for me, for you know, check hierarchy. I tend to leave peekable checks for later on in the seed and do the ones where it could be anything earlier, but that also sometimes gets me into trouble because mm -hmm. those peekable checks might not be the... Uh, rather, sometimes the peekable checks are the faster checks, and if you leave that for the end, then all of a sudden, you know, a really quick thing like Esther Mountain or um, uh, Collapsing House becomes something that you don't do because it's the thing you don't need mm -hmm, right? sure. so that's that's one of those philosophy style questions so i like your guys answers as well uh to that sort of option here as we see fitz taking on a dragon so maybe he's got an esper with some spells that he wants to learn on it he's ten up here he also knows that yeti can't be a character so he's a little light on experts so i like this choice of going to the spot blue as you mentioned three checks here in one area so very good bang for you. i i, I want to go back to that uh game planning point a little bit also you know circling back to know thy enemy if i have a peekable check and that's very peekable and that's something like cave on the belt um i would say seven out of ten runners are going to save that for last when they need one more character or one more esper just to see if it's worth their time or not knowing that seven out of ten characters or seven out of ten runners are going to do that maybe instead of going to burning house and awful check all together maybe i do that instead whereas cave on the belt isn't a slow check by any means it's just peekable so that's why people going to save it don't save it to later let that be your off the wall check get whatever is there you know an hour before everybody else will and let that be your shot in the dark play that people are going to end up doing anyways and see how that pays out for you. And it's tricky to kind of strike that balance because I've, I've sort of, in my own Worlds Collide journey, I've sort of gone back and forth where, you know, originally I would just, I would do the best check I could. You know, the, the best check that I think I'm going to go do that. And then I would start to get into that mindset of, oh, my opponent is X. I know they're going to do this. I want to diverge, so I'm going to do this instead. Mm -hmm. And I think it's easy to overcorrect on that way to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to do off the wall stuff. I'm going to go to Miranda and I'm going to go, you know, to Nikea World of Ruin just because I know nobody else will check. And you can, you might find those edge cases, but at a certain point, you're spending a lot of time just to sort of be different and maybe find an advantage. I think at the end, especially for our Moogles in the Moogle Cup, I think really focusing on the fundamentals, just do the best thing that you think, you know, and again, your, your mentors will be there to guide you. I, I think, you know, there's a time later on for maybe adding some of the gamesmanship, some of the sort of game theory of I'm going to do X because I know my phone will do Y. But I think really just focusing on those fundamentals of doing the very best thing you can. Um, just like this bridge troll for Gar is doing the best thing it can by <laughs> preventing him from ever getting through this check. Yeah, a lot of yeah, people is... just will not do this check because of the... it's definitely understandable for sure. Yeah. But anyway, go ahead. You can backdoor that guy. You don't. He doesn't have to be on the right side of the bridge. He could be on the far left and goes left a few it's, times. It's so nerve-wracking to do it that way, though. I've done it, and I feel like a hero when I do it, but uh, usually I just get pushed off, and I feel like a sad person. All right, so we'll see here if it was Gogo's zone eater check all along, or if we've got to dive into one of Edgar's checks or another one of Terra's checks. And I think we've seen all of them except for... Mobile is, and there it is, the god amongst men. It's Strago, down in the zone meter. So this will be interesting to see what Gar does, because he now has six characters, right? So at this point, when you have your character requirements, does then a light switch go off and go, okay, I am now excluding a bunch of different checks because I know that I can get a character from it. I only want to do S for item checks, and I only want to do peekable checks. What do you guys think? Is that sort of the game plan for Gar from here on out? 100%. Uh, Esper only and or quick peekable checks. So, I mean, he's got some great options right now. I mean, he's got Setzer with Search the Skies. Actually, I think he might have already searched the skies, but, you know, that's a great example. Tritok is another one, um, you know, open for everybody and an easy one to forget about when you don't have Umaro. But Tritok's another check where you're not going to get character flooded off Tritok. It's just not going to happen. So, 
between that and some of the quick peek goals, although I think he's peaked most of them, but I mean, you can see he's doing the Mobley's peak right now. I think those are great options for him of, of opportunities where you can just try to avoid that last character. There's no sense in chasing a skip. This has been a pretty fast seed, so just get the Espers you need and, and finish the job. You both the same, Glue? Yeah, I, I think also part of it too is there are only so many people checkers in the game. So it's important that, you know, when you go to Mount Zozo and you get character number seven, character number seven is not back working at all. Um, in fact, it's not uncommon. Uh, I would say probably even half the seeds you end up with more than six characters. You end up with seven or eight, or you end up with ten espers. That, that's not an uncommon thing. That's something that typically, you know, may happen. Not, not more often than not, but that's just, just the way the seed rolls sometimes. We did see a second experience egg from one free fits too, so I think we're really going to test whether the experience eggs will be able to make up the uh, the quick routing that Gar has had. And again, that's something that I think we'll be explaining to Moogles that it, sometimes you're just at the mercy of route root mm -hmm. luck, right? That sometimes you, you pick the wrong checks and that's why you lose a race. I mean, it's a randomizer. Sometimes the rando's going to random and sometimes that means that you just happen to go to the wrong spot. And right now we're seeing Gar's just happening to make all the right choices in terms of where he's going. He's getting ahead on progression as a result. Yeah, Fitz does yeah. have two experience eggs, so he's going to have two absolutely loaded characters by the end of a seed, plus, plus whatever he has left over. But sometimes even if you get blessed with the right items, if you don't get the right blessed with the right check order, in terms of your priestess progression, that's just the way it goes sometimes. Yeah, the, the other interesting thing is that his characters are higher levels than Gar, right? So mm -hmm. even though he's done some maybe perhaps longer checks, hopefully his future bosses will go down faster because they are at less levels than Gar's are right now. And he also has more levels on his characters. So sometimes the longer check might be fruitful if it means you're going to gain a bunch of extra levels and that obviously is hard to tell unless you're you know doing a retrospective on it or you do something on purpose you say i am doing elite river so i can get a ton of levels and steamroll the rest of the sea i want to do it early for that particular reason yeah and another one of these things that kind of comes with experience where you know originally and i think we probably all started the same where Fixed encounter checks are for the beginning of seeds, right? That's where you want to get levels. But sometimes it's kind of nice late game. If you're maybe not quite as high level as you want to be, sometimes those fixed encounter checks, even the dreaded burning house, uh, you know, that might get you 20 levels with your experience egg and you're not going to take very long. I mean, we've seen the shock character doing work the whole time. Tara's going to shock her way through that burning house in about three minutes, maybe less. So you can clear that check out fairly quickly and you're going to get an awful lot of levels going through something like a burning house or elite river. Uh, Schwartz, I got a question from chat. I'm going to let you sure. answer this. Uh, TSS420 is asking, what is the best lore for offense? Uh, Grand Train. It's basically a cheaper, less powerful version of Ultima. It's mm -hmm. non-element. It hits everything on the screen. Uh, it does split damage, so it's similar to Ultima in that particular aspect. It actually has this faster casting time than Ultima, maybe? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I actually have a time that it might be around the same. But it essentially is a lesser version of Ultima. Quasar is a little bit less than that, so those are probably the two best ones that I could think of. Uh, as one for fits, validate to see pet the dog there. Um, Very nice. Early game, though, you might get use of the Blowfish, Blowfish lore, which is straight up a thousand damage. So if the boss has, you know, less than a thousand health, it's basically a one shot kill. So any of those are probably the best offensive lures. Um, if you have some enemies that are weak to, say, wind or water, of which there really isn't all that many, you can use arrow or clean sweep and aqua rink right but more likely than not you're you're looking for those last two lures on the list quasar grand train what are your thoughts on exploder uh okay exploder is the last lore on the list so never mind i, I stand corrected <laughs> <laughs> um i have only used exploder once uh and it was to kill off a magic master very very slowly mm -hmm. um it's it's that, so basically what it does is you kill your own character and the character does the amount of damage they have health for. So that is really the only situation I would ever use it in is uh, if you have absolutely nothing else to damage a Tritok, Magic Master, one of those sort of things. Now another thing yeah. I want to point out that nobody has showed us, showcased us yet is that Multi-Summon is on for the Mughal Cup. 
Um, I don't believe we've come across Bahamut, but you don't just have to do offense with the multi-summon. Uh, multi-summon if you come across Fenrir, that enables you to summon it on every tier of Final Kefka. Uh, double down, what are some of the other summons that are uh, useful in Worlds Collider? Final Fantasy VI in general, you might summon. Well, I mean, there's obviously, we all know about Golem and Fenrir when it comes to Calmness Protection. And then, of course, Bahamut is essentially Ultima. A little less potent than Ultima. Uh, much cooler animation, but uh, you can't go wrong with that. Uh, sometimes, if you desperately need healing, you've always got uh, Starlet or um, Seraphim if you really hate healing effectively. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other situational ones. You know, I've occasionally pulled out Stray to hit Muddle on a Katana Soul or, you know, something else I need to Muddle. Uh, Siren is another classic where, of course, we need Siren a lot, um, especially to apply Mute on Tier 2 in Kefka's Tower. Um, and there's a couple other. Most of the attacking Espers, unfortunately, are not very good in Final Fantasy VI. Um, really, Bahamut is the top of the pile, and then occasionally you might get some use out of Alexander, who's got one of the coolest animations and a great name um, in terms of his attack ability. I mean, it's, it's great to just deploy some justice on people. And... Uh, I guess occasionally you might find some use from Torado if uh, you just want to use one of like the three different Earth attacks that are in this game. But um, you know, yeah, there's occasionally going to be situations for Hyden, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you're you're really digging deep. Well, I guess uh, the Midgard Swarmer is going to come out and help you. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's a few other niche ones. I mean, you guys have any uh, off-brand Esper favorites you like to multi-summon? I think Tritok is very underutilized because while there are a handful of enemies that you know it's not effective on just because they'll absorb one of the elements, there are more than you think of where it's useful such as regular Atma and then obviously all the non-elemental bosses that are out there. Um, yeah, I, I like in particular casting something like Phantom against a boss that usually does only physical attacks. Right, because then they will just completely miss you most of the time. Or if you know that there is a Gigantos monster in a box that you're really not quite ready for yet, um, you know, you could use Phantom and basically neutralize that entire thing here. Um, mm -hmm. So those are some, those are definitely some interesting things. So one thing I want to talk to you guys about, because I know you mentioned Glue, is Shock. So Shock is a extremely effective ability in both the early and mid game, and it sort of tapers off towards the end because of the fact that it is a multi-target um, attack and it does split damage. And on the final boss, especially, it's not very effective because of how many different parts there are for the final boss. So I think this could be a teachable moment for our Moogles to say, I know you have shock now, and I know you've been using it this entire scene, but at some point, you should probably pivot off of this to something else in order to fight Kefka. That constant duality of kill the thing that's in front of me, but also I have to fight Kefka at the end of the scene, too. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have another question from chat from Permish86. Permish, my dog, how you doing? Uh, Permish asks, question for the commentators, what are your preferred skills to have and why? Uh, I'll take this first one. This first one, and I'll take uh, probably the best one. I'll take that one right away. But I'm a big proponent of once I see throw, I look for skeins, I look for earrings, and I figure the rest out later. The reason for that is is that the elemental abilities that you can throw with skeins at at uh, at monsters is very overpowered early, and then it kind of tapers off in the same way that Schwanz just mentioned Shock does. Um, it, it doesn't scale as well, but what does scale even better is the physical aspects of throw, whether it's through Shurukens, Ninja Stars, or even Mithril Knights or Dirks. Um, the physical damage will just escalate as your levels grow, so once your elemental magical abilities kind of taper off with the throw command, you have a built-in endgame build already coming along the whole time that you didn't realize and that your Shurukens are going to start taking over for you. So, I mean... I think for me, I mean, like the, the real answer is item, but let's, I mean, I, I know what the, the <laughs> real question is. So uh, I'm going to take a little bit of an oddball one. And I mean, a throw is incredible. Don't get me wrong. Like there's, you're never unhappy to see throw. The one I'm going to say, and this is maybe a little out there. I think sword tech is one of the ones I'm almost always excited to see. Sword tech is handy early game. You've got sword tech one, which is a defense ignoring ability. Um, you're never sad to see that early. And sometimes that might be something that can help you get through some early bosses. Uh, 
Sword Tech 5 is basically an unlimited elixir for that character. Sword Tech 6 is a nice little magic tech, but what I really like about Sword Tech is Sword Tech 7. I'm a real sucker in this game for anything that can do more than 10,000 damage on one action, and Sword Tech 7 is exactly one of those things. So that's really important on fights like Tier 3 is probably the most notable one where if you can do more than 10,000 damage in one action, you can sidestep a lot of the nastiness that Tier 3 of Final Kefka can do. So anything that lets me do that to break that 99-99 threshold, I like, and Sword Tech is one of the most straightforward ways of doing that. Yeah, so we do have the faster Sword Tech here in Worlds Collide, where the bar and the meter does not tick up all that slowly compared to what it was in Vanilla. In Vanilla, it's like letting your clothes dry on a... Uh, on a clothesline out in the sun in worlds collide we have a dryer put your clothes in the dryer and you'll be much better off for them i i sort of disagree with sword tech seven but for single target damage because most of the time it's essentially like a longer version of flare but i do agree with you that breaking the quad mine damage cap is sort of important and here we see gar utilizing one of the new things for this flag set remembering that the second phase of SR Behemoth, insert whatever SR stands for here, is actually undead. So we we have restored the undead property for bosses, so nice to show him off there. Um, for me personally, as he grabs Fenrir Kama's protection, I, am, I, I like seeing slots early on in my seeds because it basically almost guarantees you to get an AoE attack that will clear out mobs, and most of them are defense ignoring, so it doesn't really matter how big and bad the boss is that's in front of you, and I just spam the A button, and 95 times out of 100, I'd say, I'd either, I either get 7 flush or Chocobop. If I'm lucky, I'll get, you know, one of the other things like H-Bomb and, and Sun Flare if it happens to be the right RNG type seed. But for me, since slots is a magic based ability and magic is very powerful in the beginning of seeds, I like to see slots show up at the beginning of my seeds to help clear out my mobs, get my levels, and perhaps if there's a boss with some big bad heavy defense like, oh, I don't know, a Doom Gaze or a Poltergeist in one of my early checks, that's a decent way for me to sort of cut them down uh, to size of them. Now, now let me kind of flip the script here and, and sort of take this question in the opposite direction uh, because this is a scenario that I think a lot of our Moogles are going to encounter occasionally in this flag set and certainly when they move beyond the Moogle Cup. How do you, and I'll, I'll start with you, Schwanz, how do you approach a seed um, when you start with, let's say it's kind of one of those dreaded scenarios of like you've got a character who's got Runic, you've got a character who's got Steel, and you've got a character who's got Morph. So <laughs> there's no immediate actions, right? Like yeah. you're, you're not really loving your life at that point. So... Uh, how do you break into that kind of seed? What's your approach, and, and sort of how do you how do you get into things there? Yeah, so it is you're doing more checking of chess and more shopping. You might even actually be taking more free checks in the hope that you get either a Ted check or a really good Esper that'll help blow open the seed a little bit more. Right, you're gonna unfortunately have to rely on what the seed gives you more than just being okay with the ability that you have to start unfortunately that's just some of the way it is sometimes so in in this particular flag set we do have our cheap rods and shops we do have super balls for sale so shopping is probably even more valuable in the Moogle cup uh set of options than it is in some of our other uh standard raising flags but that's sort of what i would do is more more looting more shopping i i might even get over 70 chests looted for the seed. That's, that's a really hard bargain for me sometimes, but <laughs> I might actually have to go there. What about you, Will? Um, that, that really makes you want to utilize, you know, more more chests and then really visiting more shops while you go about that process because that makes the earrings even more important to find for, for multiple of your characters because there's a good chance. Now, you're really, you know, having some bad RNG if your first one or two espers you find don't have a bolt to... They don't have a flare. They don't have a pearl. Um, never mind one of the really, really good tier three spells that that, that, that you want to find. There's a good chance that they'll have one of those plus one of the lower range uh, spells. Flare is good enough to get you through an entire seed on its own. It just takes so long to cast, and then once you get to the higher levels, it will kind of taper off, as we mentioned earlier with shock. But it's good enough. Um, but as while you have good enough, you can kind of work to find better. 
Um, because as you're going through progress, some of them progression, some of them will be dead, and they'll give you, you know, those items that help you with your uh, ability to kill stuff. So, so you really just got to keep working in until you find something to go on about your business. And keep in mind, um, that kind of circles back to another point I like to mention in that um, not all seeds are created equal. Um, you're not going to set a PB or the opportunity to set a PB on some seeds. And one of the things about becoming better at World's Glide is just taking what the seed gives you and being able to make the most out of it. So when you play those harder seeds, you're really, you know, iron sharpens iron and you're really grinding and learning how you can get through these difficult problems and then you can you know learn to minimize your time in the moment as opposed to just a faster time overall Ooh, you uh you you took my next question now and we do see gar heading into kafka's tower and i'm sure we'll talk about kafka in a sec but i have one other question for the two of you and i'll i'll start too um because i was going to ask what you the, the one thing you wish you knew when you were at the Moogle age, you know, that, that you kind of learned later, because for me, it was probably the value, and you kind of touched on the strings glue, is the value of playing those bad seeds that mm -hmm. I think early on, I was like a lot of other players where I just wanted to like roll jet seeds and get great times and like get sub 90 and be a real boy. Like that was the quest at first. <laughs> and I think over time, what I really started to learn was that playing those crappy seeds, playing those dreaded runic steel morph seeds or, um, you know, mog, Umaro go go seeds those are the ones that make you better runner and i mean you're not going to get sick pbs but if you start tracking like your average last 10 times you're really going to see your improvement um glue what about you what was the one thing that you wish when you were moogle somebody pulled you aside and said hey young pup when you're a dog you're going to do this let me tell you this now i, I wish i had played with the flag sets more when i at first started learning and what do i mean by that um i i I we kind of did this uh, a few months ago, or I I went to Schwantz. I was like, hey, I, I really don't understand dance and Waltz Clyde. Will you show me how to dance? Will you take me under your wing and we go outside and two step? And he said, I'd love nothing more than the two step with you, Drinks Glue. So what we did is we just rolled a seed. Um, we actually think the video is somewhere, probably on the YouTube maybe. But basically, we rolled a seed with a bunch of characters that gave him the dance ability, and we went around found all the dances and you know read what they all did and. Explained what they did, and I wish I had done that more with the various abilities and the various items. Like, take a Moogle Cult flag set and take an Ultra Sweet flag set, and give yourself rage, and give yourself all 255 rages, and force yourself to just have the rage spreadsheet handy, or make your own, and just, you know, I, I'm going to hack this flag set, I'm going to have these three rages characters with all the rages in the game. I'm not just going to use Stray Cat on all of them. I'm going to force myself, each character, to do five or six different rages. So that way I know when I'm stuck with Water Edge or, uh, oh, no. yeah, Water Edge from a Ninja or even more rare use case that I'm equipped for that because it may not come up today, it may not come up tomorrow, it may not come up for three months, but there's going to be a scenario where you really wish you knew Ninja was Water Edge and that could be in a Guardian fight where that's all you have to get through it and you just aren't aware of it. All right, so Fitz got sick of the bridge troll, which stinks because that would have given him the sixth character, but I think he's going to get his other sixth character here with Strago at, at, at Zozo. So at least that's not going to come back and bite him uh, <laughs> as badly. Um, uh, there's another question in chat we'll get to in just a second, but for me, and this is something I try and teach my mentees, not every character has to learn every spell. Stop messing around with your espers. If you see a good Esper bonus on a character that you know is going to do X, Y, Z, for instance, I have a Sword Tech user, any Strength plus whatever Esper is going to be on, keep it on that character the whole seed. And maybe if there's a spell that's on that Esper, you really have to teach a character, give it to that character before you're taking Dragon Fight, because you know that you're going to get the MP for it. Instead of being stuck micromanaging your Espers, right? Not every character has to learn every spell. Usually you have one or maybe two characters that are going to be your magic users. Those are the people that you need to teach most of the spells to. Or maybe not even all of them. If you have one Esper with Mute on, then only one character needs to know Mute, right? You're only going to use it one time in the entire scene. So that's something that I like to impart advice on. And that's definitely something I try and keep in my own mind. Because I would spend way too long in the menu micromanaging my Espers like that. And that's, uh, funnily enough, that's one of the reasons, and not the only reason, but that's one of the reasons why, um, and this question gets asked a lot in Ultra League, but you'll notice this also in Moogle Cup, 
the uh, Esper completed star flag is not on. So I think a lot of time that can build that bad habit because we all played this well. Most of us played this vanilla. And of course, when you play Final Fantasy VI in vanilla, everybody ends up knowing every spell by the end. And that's kind of one of the little mini games you play where just, I'm going to make everybody an Omni caster. They're all going to know a million spells. They're only ever going to cast Ultima, but they're going to know every spell possible. And in this, I think you really want to be a lot more tactical and you really want to be a lot more smart with how you approach those espers. You don't just want to spam spells on everybody because you're right. There's not a lot of use for it. You can be very tactical and you can cut down on a lot of menu time by avoiding that. So another question from the chat, I think has come up a couple of times. How does XP scaling work exactly? So we've kind of alluded to it earlier on in the stream. Apologies if you are just coming by here, but essentially experience scaling or the, 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 the enemy scaling here is we have both Doom and Goddess in the middle slot for KT. Wow. Is that by design? Uh, Did we mess up the flags? No, uh, no, I think Guardian, the Guardian boss was Doom and now this is Goddess. Unless I'm wrong. But anyway, um, so level scaling. So the levels of your enemies are based on basically your counting stats here. Your your characters plus espers plus dragons times two. Generally speaking, you want to keep your party's level somewhat above or even with the level of the enemies. And one of the things that we talked about earlier on as our runners were talk, you know, going through the beginning of the seed is how much free progression do you want to take? And part of the thing with free progression is you get goodies in order to beef up your party, but also the enemies that you're fighting, they are going to be getting stronger. However, they also grant more XP because the amount of XP that enemies give is also based on characters plus experts plus dragons times too. So the higher the level that enemies are, basically how the formulas calculated is we took the vanilla level of the enemy so i don't know what the statue bosses are but i think they're in like the 60s or 70s in the vanilla game we divided that by the current level that the scaling is and basically did some multiplication right so every enemy in the game has a xp per level calculation and a hp per level calculation and an mp per level calculation and those are different values that we give the enemy um, and with ability scaling, uh, Double Down, you want to go into that a little bit with, you know, how ability scaling works based on now the fact that we have the boss's HP, the boss's MP, the amount of XP it gives. There's also that ability scaling that goes on. Uh, uh, b before you answer that, Double Down, I want to pop quiz Swans yeah. here. Uh, um, oh, no. True or false, all three of the statue bosses have the same level in Final Fantasy, uh, vanilla level. True. Hey. False. False, my friend. They're all different. Now, I, I, I am not uh, I, I'm not going to memorize what they all are. I just remember they're all off by like five APs. So I think it's like 64, 69, and 74. But go they're, on. they're much higher. So yeah, they're... That's, the, that's the other thing is that some bosses are actually always scaled down from what they are in the Vanilla. And the statue mm -hmm. bosses are that way. Well, unless you're so. playing a masochistic flag set where you're, you're getting up to like <laughs> level 80 or something, then uh, they might be higher level. Good good luck yeah. with that flag set, though. Yeah, right. Uh, so ability scaling. One of my favorite things in Worlds Collide, actually. It's really cool. So so what the developers have done, and the original developer, a person named Atmatech, who uh, you know really given us this glorious Praise sport me. that we've been playing. Yeah, we, you know, back in the 70s when he, uh, he originally made Worlds Collide, uh, just an innovator and a, a vision. But what ability scaling does is basically every spell that enemies use, it's been put into a family. So like, for example, there's a, a fire family of spells that's like starts with fire, like the weak guys, like fire, fire one, um, you know, fire two. And then near the end, you get into like the really scary fire spells, stuff like Merton or Flare Star. So a boss who would normally cast, let's say, Merton. If you fight them earlier, they're going to be way down in like the, the early parts of that spell family. So where they would normally cast Merton in their script, they're instead going to cast something like Fire or Blaze or something that's a lot more palatable. Um, on the flip side, something that casts something sort of innocuous in the vanilla game, if you fight them and you've scaled up very, very you know, high in the game, so you're fighting them near the end of the seed, they might be doing something much scarier. So... Fumbaba, for instance, you know, he I think in vanilla, he probably casts like Bolt 2 and Bolt 3 and stuff like that, but those Bolt spells might be scaled up, and now he's going to be casting 
Bolt 3 and Gigavolt. Um, boy, Bolt's a bad example. There's not really a great, uh, maybe Diffuser. Does he use Diffuser? I don't know. But either way, so that's, that's what you'll see that basically things in a family um, of spells, you'll see stronger abilities or weaker abilities later on, depending on how they've been scaled. I feel like that's not a great explanation, but uh, hopefully you get the idea. And the wiki, by the way, is uh, excellent. So ff6worldscollide.com, uh, there's a link to the wiki there. It's got some really, really good information. So you can see all those different spell families. You can understand that, you know, when we're talking about water spells, they start with these little tiny guys and end up with like Clean Sweep and Aqua Rake at the end. So, or Water Edge. Um, so really good, get familiar with that. You don't have to memorize it all. Uh, clearly I haven't based on my, <laughs> my description of it as uh, Gar starts in tier one of Final Kefka, but um, you know, really good to have that basic understanding of the me mechanics of scaling and ability scaling. Drink Clue, did I miss anything? No, I, I think a great example would be Chupon. Um, Chupon in the vanilla game, he has, his script is pretty simple. Uh, on turn number one, he will attack 100% of the time. And on turn number two, he's either gonna do fireball or he's gonna attack. Uh, two thirds of the time, fireball one third of the time. Now, when Tupon is scaled lower than fireball, that that fireball spell is going to be like fire or blaze, the lower tier fire abilities. Um, but when he's scaled the maximum, uh, that fire spell is going to be fire three or possibly Merton, just one of the, or excuse me, Flare Star, one of the nastier fire spells in the game. So fireball mid range, you know, maybe catches by surprise in the vanilla game. Uh, what he can be scaled up to can really catch you by surprise on his turn two. Yeah, so I did post the link in the chat. It is from our wiki. There is a spreadsheet, and it basically has a monster table. And you could look up all of the different monsters in the game, and you could see what their HP per levels are, right? All the way on column V, all the way on the right-hand side. So you have to do some maths in order to figure out, well, what level are the enemies scaled to? Characters, espers, dragons times two. And then multiply that level times that HP number over there in the corner, and that's how much health uh, your enemies will have. So you can basically see uh, enemies that are going to be really beefy bosses. Welk Shell uh, is number one, believe it or not. Uh, Fun Bob is number two, which is, I thought it was pretty crazy, actually, but it makes sense. Fun Bob is pretty beefy most of the time, right? And Vargas is actually after in Tangier, the next one after that. So mm -hmm. those are the monsters that are going to take a while to kill. Uh, Vargas, fortunately, is not going to really hurt you. But you could sort of see what kind of fight you're in for, taking a look at this chart and figuring out the multiplication and you could do some awesome spreadsheet knowledge. I know Double Down loves his spreadsheets, so if you need help, you could ask mm -hmm. him about how to, how to calculate themselves. Oh, I love a Google Sheet. And again, these are the kind of things that a mentor in the Moogle Cup is going to be on hand to, to tell you at the time. So, I mean, if you're having some of these fights, like you're fighting Chupon, if you have Drinks Glue sitting right there, he's going to give you the 411 on what Chupon is going to be doing to yeah. him next. Although, hopefully, with Drinks Glue behind you, he's probably just going to be sneezing next because you're going to kill him really fast. Yeah. But there's a lot of other things that I think we've seen our, our mentors in this race do that we didn't get a chance to touch upon in this, but they'll be able to walk you through. So things like we saw Gar set up his party for KT. I mean, there's a lot of art and nuance to who goes in what lane and why you put certain characters why you want your physical guys to fight more fights, all these kind of things, Gar would be there to explain it to you. Yeah. Or, um, you know, we see one free fits kind of deciding when to go into KT. Maybe he wasn't ready yet. Maybe he's thinking about a skip, when to decide to, or when to, decide to maybe chase that skip. So these are all the sorts of things that the mentors are going to be on hand to tell you and, and walk you through and give you their guidance yeah. on during Spe the Cup. Speaking of that mentor, Gar is doing so well right now because I am yes. here, but that's, you know, on the other side between between talking here. Um, Y'all want to play a game? You guys want to play a game? We, beautiful. We, we've had a number of questions in chat, so I'm going to say I'm going to rapid fire some of them at y'all, and we'll give you sure. 10 seconds to answer. The lightning 10 round. seconds to answer. If you don't answer in seconds, I'm going to cut your mic, kick you out the Discord voice, and you have to rejoin. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll, we'll start with it. Schwantz. Schwantz, what are your thoughts on the Coliseum? 10 seconds or less, go. Coliseum is great if you start with Umaro or if you don't have anything offensively for your party to have. Go check the Coliseum early on in the seed because later on you will. Dang! These garbage Ten seconds spells. at past. Ten <sighs> seconds at past, good sir. All right, I need to talk fast. Very well said. Uh, 
Uh, can, I, can, I, can I interject real fast before of we course. start the next lightning round? So Fitz used the Morph ability on his Edgar in order to get through that goddess fight. Morph will allow you to do double damage with either physical or magical attacks, and it cuts incoming magic damage in half as well. So great use of a underused ability with Morph. Morph bo Morph's bar fills up as you get MP from your boss fights, capping out at 255 MP, and when you use up some of that morph bar, you just need to get more MP from boss fights with that character to get it back. So, anyway, I have a lightning round. Double down, what is your least favorite trick and why? Oof, uh, it depends on the day, but gun in my head, that's the Ancient Castle, the worst. Hate that run, love the music, mm. I hate the run down there. Good answer. Uh, Swans, upon completion of the Moogle Cup, will graduates be able to sub our seeds like Gar? Uh, absolutely. I guarantee, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am not going to put my, my foot in my mouth that far. The, the goal of the Moogle Cup is to more to get yourself more familiar with these situations and understand sort of how the game works and how to get yourself out of a sticky situation. Again, as Double Down mentioned earlier, you know, I know that us as speedrunners, our sort of uh, thing that keeps us going is what is our fastest time? How do I get my times down? How do I get, you know, what's my personal best? And when you're playing Worlds Collide, basically every seed is a PB, right? Because every mm -hmm. seed is something different. So if you start thinking about it more in that aspect of how do I sort of make the average of most of my seeds, you know, maybe one hour and 15 minutes instead of can I get a sub 60 one day with one miracle seed that R and Jesus praise be, I left my crystals out in the moonlight, finally something's happening to me, right? That's sort of the goal of the Moogle Cup is to get you to be a more well-rounded player so that this way most of your seeds are taking a similar amount of time to runners that have been doing this for a while. Schwanz, I think we need to get you a mentor for lightning rounds and uh, <laughs> understanding how lightning rounds work. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Babbling. I love it. You should call me the Brook 27. I'm babbling. Anyway. Um, go ahead. Uh, question for Double Down. What can we do to make the leader boss fight a little tougher? Ice tough enough as already. Axe is a scary attack. I've died to it. Leader's great. No changes. 10 out of 10. No notes. Amazing. There's a normalized and distort flag. Play with that, friends. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's Play answer. with that and make the fight even easier somehow. That's for the Yeti Cup. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think Gar doesn't have the one-turn ability to get this under one hour, but he's going to come in at, you know, less than an hour and one minute some way somehow, I think, here. Which is very impressive, and then Again, you can get this type of insight. You can get this knowledge from Gar. How, how does he do this? Um, Gar, I have done two seasons of Ultra League, and Gar has finished second in the Mega Lix division in both of them. So Gar is just the best of the best, save for one guy in our community, in my opinion. And you can get these types of insights from him, possibly. For the record, he tied for second one of those seasons. Oh, just uh, maybe that was before is, I. Before Double down time. erasure here. <laughs> get, that, get those facts straight, Blue, okay? Yeah, oh, my apologies. <laughs> Come on. My, my moment of glory. I'm living in a nightmare. All right, um, one, one last question, uh, right. not for Schwantz. Uh, uh, least oh, favorite max skilled boss fight. Double I down. I going to give it to you. Oh, um, let's say Atma, because Goner, Fallen One, stuff like that, really annoying. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. All right, Schwanz, what's yours? Ten seconds or less. Uh, I like that answer. That's a good answer. I'll stick with it. Yes. Perfect. Drinks glue. Least favorite max scale boss fight. You can take 20 seconds because you didn't answer any of the other questions. <laughs> I'm going to say it, whether it's max scale or least scale, I'm just going to say piranhas. I, I, don't, I don't care if the hit is doing 6k damage or if it's doing 200 damage. I hate piranhas. Oh, um, Gar, you still have a Super Bowl left. I yeah. think I think Gar is gonna get to beat this Kefka. So, for our Moogles watching, hopefully we're not setting unrealistic expectations. Obviously, like with some of our high-end runners, you're seeing a couple of our really top-end runners, as Drinks Glue just mentioned. Um, you know, 
they're going to be able to obliterate these seeds, but don't feel bad if you're a Moogle just starting out and you're getting like sub two hours on these seeds. Like, that's great. There's really, like, we all started there. I think we all remember our first seeds. Mine was probably, I don't even know if I set a timer. My first time seed was probably like three hours or something like that. Schwan Strength Glue, probably about the same. I mean, we all started uh, there. Bold and... to assume I finished, but go on. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> exactly. And that's the idea of the Moogle Cup is that you at least will hopefully not get in a situation where you just have to FF. You should be able to finish it. So don't feel like you've got to do this in like a, a heroic gar time here of 105 or whatever you ends up finishing at. Yeah, the more you play, and for me, I think one of the interesting things that I did was I watched a lot of races before I even mm -hmm. played my first seat too. So sometimes not even playing the game, but at least watching what other people do and hearing commentary give, you know, sort of feedback will also help you out too. So basically, just make Worlds Collide your full-time job from now until the Global Cup, and you'll be okay. So true. I've, I watched so many seeds, especially when I started out watching like the Zelfers and the Falconets and the Javanators and folks like that. All right, so we do have a time. 102.23 for Gar. Get your GGs in the chat, folks. Very nicely done. And uh, speaking of getting in the chat we dragged gar on up here against his will because we're going to demand answers about how he was able to finish that seed in such an impressive time and uh gar what, what I, are your thoughts of the moogle cup flags uh so moogle cup flags i think i really like them mm -hmm. they are uh, appropriately tuned for a beginner and i think that this is a great way to kind of ease yourself into the world's collide experience and uh Really, I, I kind of don't have anything to say about the seed at all, other than uh, finding like a, a cure two or cure three spell would have been uh, maybe a little nice. But yeah, no, I think that this was uh, a, a very nice introduction to the flag set. You have realm with health. That's fine. Yeah, uh, realm with health is fine. However, there are some things that might trip a newer player up. For example. Uh, I had to use a remedy, or an echo screen would have worked, on Realm. Uh, and if I did not do that because she was silenced, her health command would not work. So, it's almost, like, almost like health is just Cure 2 with a different name. God. It, is, it is literally just Cure 2 without an MP cost. And, so, and it applies to both sides in a, in a pincer attack. Don't forget about that. That's true, that's true. Uh, sometimes that comes up. But yeah, no, uh, fantastic seed, early offense, uh, tons of Ultima, uh, there was uh, an Illumina like super early. So uh, at the start, I said that I was gonna go get a bunch of offense and then just start doing checks. And that's exactly what the seed provided. Uh, two questions, Gar. First of all, first question. How dare you? Second question: um, <laughs> What are you What are you looking forward to most about uh, mentoring some of our Moogles in the Moogle Cup, especially now having played one of the seeds? Oh goodness, I like seeing people improve at the game just in general. I, I I've helped a, a fair number of people, I think, and it, it is always a genuine pleasure to to watch their time sl slowly creep down. And I really, really hope to do that here. I hope that I get to train. Uh, like the next up and coming generation of Falcon hits, you know? That is my ultimate goal. I want people to win, I want people to have fun playing the game, uh, and I want to kind of be a facilitator for that process. I, I got two questions for you, Gar. The first one doesn't require an answer, I just want to hear somebody laugh. Uh, one, do you know how a lightning round works? And two, <laughs> what type of insights would you give to me? Say, I, I, I sign up, I'm a Google player, and I get assigned the Legendary Gar as a mentor. What type of insights can I expect from you? What, what point of views would you provide to the game for me a as I go on my Worlds Collide journey and start learning? Sure. So I'm all about building a very, very strong foundation. I want you to know the basics. And not only do I want you to know the basics, I want you to have mastered the basics because mastering the basics is... Honestly, about 80% of the randomizer, and the other 20% is little bits and pieces that you pick up along the way, but I, I'm really good at setting good foundations for people, I think. I want to drill it into their heads that, yes, 
you need to weight trick. Weight tricking is maybe the most important thing you can do uh, in this scene, or, or in, any, in any World's Collide scene. And, you know, just kind of build up from there. Once, once they have the knowledge, once they know uh, whose checks go where, and a little bit about routing, then we can start building on top of that. And ultimately, we want a nice, big, beautiful temple. Uh, a temple of worlds collide. So, last question for me. What's one thing in the flag set that you did that you would sort of uh, point out to a mentee as something, as like a good move? Um, you know, maybe it's using the morph command when most people just ignore it, or something else like that. Sure. So, one of the big things, one of my big things personally, is spending too long in the menu. If if you look uh, at, we, we have a, a program out there called Stats Collide. Stats Collide will tell you exactly how long you have been in a menu, exactly how long you've been in a shop, all those sorts of things. And when you look at those numbers, you realize just how much time you bleed away by being in menus unnecessarily. So I uh, I think I did a really good job this scene kind of not being in the menu as often as I should. There's the temptation there, oh, I got a new piece of gear, let me equip that really quick. But you didn't really see me do that. I equipped something at the very start and then I just kind of went with it. And there's possible, it's possible that I had better armor, for example, that I just wasn't equipping, but if you you, you see me just get through that seat, I, I had the tools to do it, so is there really a need to spend those couple of seconds of whipping armor? Is there really a need to spend 15-20 uh, seconds checking that Esper? Eh. I don't think so. So, I'm all about going fast, and that might come at the expense of what is technically correct gameplay. It's possible that one of those Espers had the Cure 2, Cure 3 that I was looking for, but there there is a, a point where you realize that you're, like the margin, marginal benefit that you get from checking that is just not, not great. So, get out of the menu. TLDR. Yeah. Especially if you're ordering lunch. Just, just get the orange chicken. It's good, trust me. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And we got Gar, or excuse me, we got one free Fitz finishing up with 108.50 as well. Um, let's let's drag Fitz up here, Mrs. Will, as well, and uh, see what he has to say about the Mobile Club flag set. GG Fitz. GG Fitz. GG Fitz indeed. Can you hear us, my dog? Unmute thyself. taking a moment for quiet reflection uh we all do this at the end <laughs> yeah, of the seat well, one of the things your mentor will tell you is after you finish the bathroom just control her down sprint to the bathroom and come back <laughs> he's going to cut the remaining uh internet cords outside of Schwanz's house that he, he missed before the seat started <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm well, only uh pm him and see if he's uh oh never mind he left against he left on his own free will. Double down, are you cutting? Are you there cutting? he goes. This is, My this is cables? Hmm. There we go. There, there, we go. Hey. there he is. Hey. <laughs> One free fits. GG. All right. How do we feel about the Moogle Cup flag set? I think they're a lot of fun. Um, my biggest regret is just... We had a lot of power available early, and I kind of messed around a little bit. Mostly because I didn't didn't find sleeping bags and shops, and so I was kind of like, I spent a couple extra minutes than I should have at the beginning. But um, I think it's a great showcase of working on that sense of like, I am good enough. I need to go get progression because I think that's a, one of the fundamental skills of of racing worlds collide, and I. And I was trying to also really think about, we had, I had access to Ultima pretty early. So it was kind of like, when is it really faster to use it versus my Edgar is swinging for like two thirds of an Ultima calf's worth of damage. And that's pretty fast. So um, 
I had it as a tool, but it was really only a couple of times where I felt like I was like, hey, this would be the fastest way through this. Yeah, so how about that uh how about that zone eater? Take us through uh Look. were you just were you just on tilt and you're like, you know what, I'm I'm out of here. I have another check to potentially get a character and I'm just gonna do that now. Yeah, I mean, like, the play-by-play -play was like, all right, Zozo or Zone Eater, two Zs, which one am I doing? And so I normally really avoid Zone Eater, but, you know, I feel like sometimes we have to go do the things that we we don't want to do that aren't our personal favorites. And then that card was really bullying me. Like, he would just not come over to where I could get past him and I got impatient, and I did feel kind of tilty, and that's when I made the call. I was like, let's just go leave and do that, and we'll think about coming back here if we have to. And luckily, I didn't have to. Yeah, there was there was a character at the end of Zone Eater, but that character did not lead to other characters, so you at least got out of, got out of get, doing that one. So I did notice also that you heavily used morph in this uh, in this speed a little bit. So tell us a little bit about you know your <laughs> usage of the morph command there. Yeah, uh, I feel like this is something I definitely try to coach with my mentees. Is like morph is a pre. I feel like a slept on command that you know whenever we use it, we're dramatically increasing our damage output. Uh, for basically no cost. Uh, and that's incredible, especially when you have like an ultimate user that has like a, a gauntlet, like the the math adding on top of each other, you know, where it's like, I had a strength Esper on him pretty much from the get go with the morph using it whenever I needed to do like big damage, but not too much meant I could always use it whenever I wanted and then adding in like having a gauntlet and the levels from the experience egg. It was kind of overkill. Like if I could have exceeded quad nines, I would have, I think with my Edgar build big time. Oh, look at you with your experience egg. Well, I had two. Two, two, two oh, eggs, guys. Cool. Yeah, experience two eggs. eggs. Enough, enough for an experience omelet. Yeah, like the like, second one was really our experience unnecessary, and I believe yeah, so a dead it check in, reward. It so. Retur yeah, it was in Returners, which is where the uh, the first egg was, and the second one I think was Tritok. Yeah, so Tritok. There was an Umaro hiding out uh, Gar at the end of the Leap River that you missed. So I wouldn't say I missed it, Schwant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you missed it! Like the encounters were incredible too like i it was a really it was one of those times that lee river was great and i was like yeah i need to show this because sometimes it'd be it's great and you have shock so you don't have to worry about a lot of things just because you, it you know we could always do damage so even like magi master i was like well tara's got a minerva so she can pretty much just solo Damn him shock, and might be yeah. slow Fitz, what are you I, most I looking forward to um, for mentoring in the Moogle Cup? What is it that's really got you most excited? Uh, I just find it very enjoyable to do. I think usually I, I learn stuff from the newer runners or it helps me also like reinforce some of my own fundamentals. I have like loot goblin tendencies sometimes or or I'll over prepare. And so coaching others to not do that and encouraging them to really try to push the pace uh, reinforces that in myself. And I also just, it's just great to watch kind of generally with some mentorship, how, f how fast someone can start cutting off like chunks of, of time. Cause as a newer player, they come off a lot faster um, and just like, also just getting to experience a little of that like new player excitement second hand uh, refreshes my own love of the game. 
even though I know I might be mentoring someone that potentially will surpass me one day, it's kind of like I welcome in. Yeah, that's a that's a feature, not a bug. Exactly. All right, Gar. Uh, before we let you and Fitz go, Gar, is there anything else you'd like to mention about the Moogle Club or anything in general you have uh, coming up by chance? Uh, sure, just a couple of things. So, Google Cup is going to be a fantastic event, uh, or set of events, I suppose. So, please, if you are brand new and you would love to get started with Worlds Collide, now has never been a better time. So, once those signups go up, be sure to check on the Discord and sign up for those. And don't forget about our Ultras League, which is just a, a quick step up from the moogle cup flag set uh that is uh, season six is currently in full swing right now so yeah get your race on very well said and then fits i posit you the same question good sir yeah i think i would just i'm sure it's been said re-emphasize like it's really about learning and, and having fun are the primary objectives like certainly you know, it's a it's a mini tournament and someone will emerge like the winner. But I think anyone that participates from either the mentor or the new player side will have a good time, learn some things and, and certainly see, uh, you know, improvement from the good effort that they they put in with their mentors. Very well said. All right. And then, of course, uh, Thank you to uh, Double Down and Drinks Glue and Schwantz for uh, putting on this restream. And then uh, a double thank you to Double Down and Drinks Glue, double, 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 double toil and trouble uh, for even envisioning the Moogle Cup in the first place. Thank you, good sir. Of course. Thanks, Car. Yeah, we appreciate you. You're welcome. It is kind of messed up. You don't want to give our tracker any kudos, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's that's low, Gar. Even for you. The, the Schwartz twenty seven. Everybody knows you. Everybody loves you. I love you. Thank you so much for tracking. So, I appreciate you. Nugly was muted <laughs> wow. by me. Nugly <laughs> could not as well. be more Thank you. disrespected <laughs> tonight. Wow. Nugly Kong, who is that? Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you no. very very much, Nugly Kong, uh, for for actually doing the tracking. Uh, Schwartz didn't do anything, so. Uh, nope. It was all you. <laughs> I, I did not answer the trivia question correctly. I played the lightning round terrible. I, I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> uh, you sent me the original link for the tracker, and oh, then and, and Blue and sent me the second the one. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. I'm all for three tonight. Nah, it's all good. Seriously, much love to, to all of y'all. Uh, y'all really do make the community special, and that's part of the reason why I am so privileged to uh, to be a mentor for y'all. All right, well, uh, well, thank you. Thank you, guys, and we wish you both a lovely Saturday evening, whatever you have left of it. Yeah. yeah. GG's. GG's Folks. Gar. GG's Fitz. GG's and Ugly. Um, GG. Just to loop everybody on an inside joke, um, I had Ugly muted apparently for about a week and didn't realize it earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> so I was consistently talking over him as we were getting ready, and uh, I, I apologize. I apologize to you in front of the World's Collide community. Um, but before we let everybody go, uh, just want to touch on a few more important details. One is the Moogle Cup preset is now live on the website. You may have to clear some cookies, clear your cache on your various browser you use, but it is live. It is there, possibly. Um... <laughs> Two, there will be some, after we go off the air, there will be some releasing of the event document, the sign-up forms, the various other things and whatnot, so be on the lookout for that. And three, what's number three? I forgot. FF6WorldsCollide.com? I don't know. This is the yeah, I think three, here. three was just the first two, I think. Oh, yeah. It's been, like, louder. Yeah. Probably. Um... But yeah, more information coming. I, I know we there's going to be a couple forms. Forms for the Moogle side, forms for the Mentos side. So it'll be a little confusing, but we'll get that organized and information and links presented in a nice and tidy fashion for everybody. Yeah, and and if again, if you're not sure if one or both of those labels apply to you, probably not both. I would be 
confused and concerned if both labels applied, but you're not sure if you are Moogle or Mentor material, reach out. Um, you know, we're happy to talk about it. Honestly, for the Moogle side, if you're not sure if you're a Moogle, you probably are, and that's okay. Um, and if you're not sure if you're a Mentor, just ask. And, you know, or you could just watch the first one and see how it goes and then maybe go from there. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, if, if you're not sure, kind, kind of compare yourself, you know, look look across the division mates and look at your Ultras League uh, where you're at. Um, maybe play a flag or two with Ultras League settings if you're not familiar. Um, if you're not familiar with Ultras League flags and say, hey, maybe I'm on the fence about playing. I just tried this. Th this wasn't for me. There was a little too hard. Then that's, you know, going to point you in the direction of, hey, the Moogle Club is for you. It's just going to reinforce that. So a little self-awareness, but again, we, we can help you get there. We can help you identify if that is for you or not. And yeah. uh, that that yeah, is so all. Thank you. I was going to say thank you, Glue, for uh, for being the the brainchild behind this whole operation and for uh, double down creating you know sort of the graphics and the design of of these sort of things. We kind of took what we did with Moogle's first uh, tournament and sort of made it timeless i think with having us you know start the start up the tournaments whenever we get to 16 entrants this way there may perhaps not be so much time in between mm -hmm. sort of these new uh new uh player onboarding sort of things and i i really like that about the uh open-ended nature of this sort of event so thank you guys for for putting it on thank you knuckly for tracking as well gar and fitz for, for running the race and showcasing off uh, the flags that really appreciated everybody. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, and then do we got anything else before we uh, let everybody go? Release the hounds. Throw up those sign-ups, Glue. Uh, I know that there have been questions about it already in the Discord, so if you uh, go to our website, ff6worldscollide.com, there is a link to the Discord. If you'd like to hop in there, I'm sure we will post... Uh, the forms and all those other things when we go live just soon and you'll be joining a wonderful community that is hopefully uh, embracing of our new people that's one way to keep the game alive so head on over to our discord and come hang out with us go yeah. to discord sign up for Moogle Cup just can't be any more simple than that those are your instructions go do it everybody who's new all right, and with that, we'll sign off. We hope everybody has a beautiful evening.